special week. Today we are still going on the Chinese New Year theme. Not a Lego scent this time. However, what we are doing is something perhaps much more interesting and much more knowledgeable. I will be reading to you a little bedtime story here. The Art of War. I will be reading parts of this. Uh, this version of The Art of War is quite good because uh, it joins things down to bullet points and it also gives us cool little pictures to read. So, without further ado, let's read The Art of War. Truly a hellfire of knowledge. Sun Tzu once said, The art of war is of vital importance to the state. It is a matter of life and death, a world either to safety or to ruin. Hence, it is subject of inquiry, which can, no, which can on no account be neglected. I can't read very well. This is going to be very interesting. The art of war, then, is governed by a five constant factors to be given into account in one's deliberations when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. These are the five factors. The moral law, heaven, earth, the commander, method, and discipline. The moral law causes the people to be in a complete accord with their ruler, so they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. And then we have a little picture. I like how five of those, I like those five uh, disciplines there. Because uh, some of them make sense, like commanders, and then some of them are like what? Like a heaven and earth. Okay, let's continue on. Heaven signifies night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. Earth compromises distances, great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, narrow passes the chance of life and death. The commander, standing for f the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage, and strictness, by method and discipline, are to be understood the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivisions, the graduations of ranking among the officers, the maintenance of roads by which suppliers may reach the army, and the control of military expenditure. These five heads would be familiar to every general he who knows them will be victorious, victorious. He who knows them will not fail. Therefore, in your deliberations, when seeking to determine the military conditions, let them be made the basis of comparison in this wise. Which of the two sovereigns is imbued with the moral law? Which of the two generals? has most ability, with whom lie the advantages derived from heaven and earth, on which side is discipline most rigorously enforced, which army is stronger, on which side are in four officers and men more likely, more highly trained, in which army is the greater constancy both in reward, in which army is the greater constancy both in reward, and punish. By means of these seven considerations, I can forecast a victory or defeat. The general that hearkens to my counsel and acts upon it will conquer. Let such, let such a uh, one be retained in command. The general that hearkens not to my counsel nor acts upon it will 
suffer to the feet. Let such of let such a one be dismissed. While heeding the profit of my counsel, and avail yourself also of any helpful criticisms offer over and beyond the ordinary rules, according as circumstances are favorable, one should modify one's plans. All will warfare is based on deception. Distance causes the people to be in power. 
salvaged. And here was another picture. said, in the practical art of war, the best thing of all is to take the enemy's country whole and intact to shatter and destroy. It is not so good. So, too, it is better to recapture an enemy, an army entire than to destroy it, to capture a, reg a regiment, a, det a detachment, or a company entire than to destroy them. Hence, to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. Thus, the highest form of generalship is to balk the enemy's plans. The next best is to prevent the junction of the enemy's forces. The next in order, the next in order is to attack the enemy's army in the field. And the worst policy of all is to besiege wall cities. The rule is not to besiege walled cities if it can possibly be avoided. The preparation of mantlets, movable shelters, and various implements of war will take up three whole months, and the piling and the piling of mounds against the walls will take three months more. The general, unable to control his irritation, will launch his men to the assault like swarming ants. With the result that one third of his men are slain while the town still remains untaken. Such are the disastrous effects of a siege. Therefore, the skillful leader subdues the enemy troops. Without any fighting, he captures their cities without laying siege to them. He overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field. With his forces intact, he will dispute the matter. 
mastery of the empire, and thus, without losing a man, his triumph will be complete. This is the method. This is the method of attacking by stratagem. I don't know how to say that word. It is the war in war, and our forces are ten to the enemy's one to surround him, if one, five to one to attack him, if twice as numerous to divide our army into two. If equally matched, we can offer battle. If slightly inferior in numbers, we can avoid the enemy. If quite unequal in every way, we can flee from them. And there is a picture of a little landscape here. Sun Tzu said, The good fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat and then waited for an opportunity of defeating the enemy. To secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands, but the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. Thus, the good fighter is able to secure himself against defeat, but cannot make it certain of defeating the enemy. Hence the saying, one may know how to conquer without being able to do it. Security against defeat implies defense tactics. Ability to defeat the enemy means taking the offensive. Standing on the defensive indicates insufficient strength, attacking subordinates of strength. The general who is skilled in defense hides in the most 
little secret recesses of the earth. He who is skilled in attack flashes forth from the topmost heights of heaven. Thus, on one hand, we must have the ability to protect ourselves. On the other, a victory that is complete. To see victory only when it is within the kin of the common herd is not the acmine of excellence. Neither is the acmine of excellence if you fight and conquer the whole empire. And the whole empire says, well done. To lift an autumn leaf, to lift an autumn leaf is no sign of great strength. To see the sun and the moon is no sign of sharp sight. To hear the noise of thunder is no sign of quick ear. What the ancients called a clever fighter is one who not only wins, but excels in winning with ease. Hence his victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage. He wins his battle by making no mistakes. Making no mistakes is what establishes the certainty of victory, for it means conquering an enemy. For it means conquering an enemy that is already defeated. And we have another picture here. the skillful fighter puts himself into a position which makes defeat impossible and does not miss the moment for defeating the enemy. Thus it is that in war the victor, the victor, the victorious strategist only seeks battle after the victory has been won, whereas he who is destined to defeat first sights and afterwards looks for victory, the consummate leader cultivates the moral law and strictly adheres to the method and discipline. Thus, it is in his power to control success. In respect of the military method, we have firstly, measurement, secondly, estimation of quantity, thirdly, calculation, fourthly, balance of chances, and fifthly, victory. Measurement owes its existence to earth, estimation, estimation of quantity, to measurement, calculation to estimation of quantity, balancing of chances to calculations, and the victory to balancing of chances. A, vi a victorious army opposed to a rooted one is as a pound's weight placed on a scale against a single grain. The onrush of of a cow the onrush of a conquering force is like the bursting of pent-up waters into a chasm a thousand fathoms deep. Here we have a larger picture. And that is the end of chapter four. We'll read chapter five, and then that's it. Sun Tzu said, the control of a large force is the same principle as the control of a few men. It is merely a question of dividing by up their numbers. Fighting with a large army under your command is no wise different from fighting with a small one. It is merely a question of instituting signs and signals to ensure that your whole host may withstand the brunt of an enemy's attack and remain unshaken. This is affected by maneuvers, direct and indirect, that the impact of your army may be like a crying stone dashed against an egg that is affected by the signs of weak points and strong. In all fighting, the direct method may be used for joining battle, but indirect methods will be needed in order to secure victory. Indirect tactics, efficiently applied, are inexhaustible as heaven and earth, unending as the flow of rivers and streams. Like the sun and moon, they end, but to begin anew, like the four seasons, they pass away. To return once more, there are not more than five musical notes. If the combinations of these five gives rise to more melodies than can be ever heard, there are not more than five primary colors. Blue, yellow, red, white, and black. Yet in combination.
television they produce more use than can ever be seen. There were not there were not more than five cardinal tastes, sour or sweet, salt, sweet and bitter, the combinations of the meal boy flavors that could ever be tasted. And there is another picture here. Even closer. 
I love you. This is where I say goodbye. Bye-bye. I love you. Bye-bye. <laughs>